If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, um, the letter that Paul wrote there, and we're going to be in chapter 5. How many of you were here last Sunday? Okay, how many of you were not here last Sunday? All right, you're backslidden. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. Last Sunday, so about half of you or about a third of you weren't here last Sunday. I'm going to do kind of a quick little recap from last Sunday, but I want to bring something to the table this morning that maybe you've never heard before like this. And it is a very familiar portion of scripture that so, so many people, I believe, have gotten wrong in their uh, understanding or their interpretation of it. And so we're going to get to that in First Thessalonians. Before we do that, I want to kind of jump into what we were talking about last week. I think like three weeks ago or four weeks ago, it's four weeks ago, I preached a message uh, said that in this house we are treasure seekers. And then last week, uh, my message was, who is at your table? And today's message is going to be called, um, The Apostle Paul's Instructions to Harvest. How's that? How many of you know that the Apostle Paul wasn't just speaking to the church of the time, but he's still speaking uh, that God inspired him to write these letters, and they're applicable to us as a church today? How many of you believe that? Come on. And so we're going to get to that in a moment in 1 Thessalonians 5, some instructions from Paul. But I kind of want to just, if we can, just uh, re, just go over, familiarize yourself with some of what I talked about last week. Uh, in the modern church today, we oftentimes see that people uh, in churches, in groups, uh, religious groups, they, they tend to gravitate towards people that look like them, think like them, talk like them, wear similar clothing. It's so funny, I have a friend of mine who's a, a worship leader, and uh, he put on Facebook that he, had, uh, he was going to a conference, they had never met him before, he was leading worship there, and he said, um, he said uh, the guy said, um, I'm here to pick you up. What are you wearing? And he said, well, basically, I look like every other worship leader. And he said, so jean jacket and skinny jeans. And literally, that's exactly what he was wearing. He took a <laughs> selfie and sent it to the guy. But in church, for some reason, we tend to end up uh, looking the same, talking the same. We, we are around people, uh, unfortunately, sometimes of the same skin color, the same socioeconomic background, the same orientation, whatever it may be. We find ourselves, uh, we like to comfortably surround ourselves with people that do not challenge us with where we're at that simply reinforce our already kind of comfortable theology or worldview. The unfortunate part of that, and the church has become a part of that, um, reinforcing that, is that it looks nothing like the life of Jesus. Jesus hung out with everybody and anybody. He was there to build relationship and to reach them where they were at. And so last week, we talked about whether it was Zacchaeus or the woman at the well or the woman caught in adultery or uh, the tax collectors or those that they called irreligious, uh, the Pharisees, those that had, you know, blatant sin in their lives. Um, he, he, he hung out with the, the refuse of society, the ones that had been rejected, the ones that had been cast aside. That's who he invited to his table. As a matter of fact, his own disciples, when he was with the woman at the well, they came to him and, and afterwards and they said, um, why would you be seen in public with her? Why would you talk to her in public? Uh, he was, even by his own disciples, those that he was teaching and imparting to, they were still questioning, should you be seen with that person? Should you be seen around them? Should you be seen talking to them? And, 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 and so last week we jumped into um, the, a bunch of stuff, but one of the things I want to highlight is we talked about Psalms 23.5, where it says, He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over or runneth over. And, and, and what we learned last week is that in order to be present, you had to be seated at the table. And so God was saying, I'm actually preparing a table before you and your enemies will be present. Seated at the table. Come on. I mean, we... We got to be real with each other. Some of us don't want to have lunch with the annoying uh, lady down the hallway at work, right? <laughs> Let alone our enemies. Yeah. But, but what I said last week was this, and if you weren't here, maybe this will hit you between the eyes, um, but it's really hard to hate up close. 
So you might have somebody in your life that just you cannot stand, or you have somebody in your life that you just can't, you don't, can't find peace with. But when you sit down and have a conversation with them and look them in the eyes and find out about their dreams, their aspirations, their, their failures, their triumphs, their struggles, whatever it may be, all of a sudden this kind of monster in the closet you know, this, this boogeyman that you've made them out to be in your mind, you begin to see the human side of them. Yeah. And we begin to open our hearts up to doing what I've been teaching the last couple of weeks, which is beginning to see beyond this false uh, identity or this false narrative that they've presented to the world to the true goal that is inside of them. No, we're living in a time and an hour in our country, politically, culturally, whatever it may be, where we are so polarized, we are so uh, divided as a nation. Uh, people are literally getting in a fist fight just because one guy has a red hat on with a slogan or another guy is dressed a certain way or whatever it may be. I mean, we're literally violently attacking one another because we don't see eye to eye on something. And that's what the world, that's what culture is out there. The problem is this church, the church has participated in it. Come on. The church has participated. And so the church should be a place where, where all are welcome and you come from different places and backgrounds and perspectives and worldviews and whatever it may be. And you come in here and we welcome you into this place and we welcome you into an invitation to understand who you are in him and, 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 and this beautiful picture of you finding yourself and working out your own salvation and all the things that we talk about. That's what the church should look like and be. It should look like the table of Jesus. And last week, it was so beautiful at the end of the table. We had a table here. We had an interesting group of people, especially in the second service. People that were not born in this country, people that don't see the world, Republicans, Democrats, uh, old, young, black, white, Hispanic, Iranian, um, somebody from the Middle East, everything was here. And it was so beautiful. And, and Jill, I want to say thank you. But at one point, Jill stood up and began to shake the people's hands at the table. And all of them so different, coming from different places in life, realizing that when we're at the table, we're actually all the same in him. Amen. It was so pretty, beautiful. And then you were, you were, didn't you help me? And then you, oh, remind me of your first name again. Dante. Dante was there. And Dante, when you stood up and started shaking people's hands and had that big smile on your face, you got like this smile, man. And it just moved my heart like you can't believe. It was a, you literally, it was a beautiful picture of what it looks like. And I got a text message from Kate later on that day. And uh, I might need to pull it up to make sure it's right. But Kate texted me later that day. And I, I really believe it wasn't my words, but I believe it was the action of those of you at the table. But she said this, let's go back to last Sunday. She said, Dan, as you seated people, I heard Jesus say, today my blood speaks. Yes. Today my blood speaks. There is no greater message in the blood of Jesus than when people can come from all different places, from all different perspectives, and sit at the same table and share the same truth that is found in the love and grace of Jesus. Come on, church. Come on, that is a beautiful picture. And I love this church because of that. We've got the oddest collection of human beings on the face of the earth. I mean, y'all just surprise me all the time. It is so beautiful because it is the, 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 it is the, the beautiful kaleidoscope of, of the kingdom that's found right here at Harvest. I never want us to be this cute, neat, little perfect church where everyone's dressed perfectly and says all the right things. And, and I just never want to be that. I always want to have a little bit of, of a rough edge to us, if that's okay. You know what I mean? I just, I, if, if, if we don't get the police called here at least once every couple months, I feel like we're, we're letting people down, all right? I do. I never want these chains to come off these doors. It's just, it's so homey in here when I'm by myself and those chains are on the doors we've been broken into so many times. I just love it. It's so beautiful. Do you know why? Because it is a picture of Jesus. Come on, church. It is a beautiful picture of Jesus. And what makes one person uncomfortable was the very thing Jesus came to die for and save. I got to preach oh, now. I got to preach. I got to get to my main message here. <laughs> so we're just going to skip ahead. We had a, some good stuff last week. You should check it out. 
Um, but at the end, we, we played a song that is very meaningful that's not actually on the Facebook Live because they would pull it down because it's a copyrighted song. But it's called Goodbye Road by Johnny Swim. I encourage you to check it out. And uh, we left last week saying we don't want to build a bigger wall, but we want to build a longer table. Yeah. Come on. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Um, this uh, Thessalonians was written to a group of people that were near, that were in, that were w w were near Greece, and it was a it was a book that Paul wrote in letters. And the first five chapters, um, specifically, are letters to this uh, church plant that Paul had there. And the first three chapters are Paul defending the actions and beliefs of this church plant. And then as we get to chapters 4 and 5, chapter 5 is the one we're going to study today. Um, chapters 4 and 5, you'll find out that he moves from defending them to teaching them. It's called moral exhortation. He begins to exhort or to teach uh, the church that if you want to be successful, if you want things to go, go smoothly, if you want to see the kingdom of God come amongst you, this is what it's going to look like. And he has five kind of main sections of this text in um, chapters 4 and 5. And we're going to actually study the last one. It's uh, verses 12 through 22. And he has a couple of sections in here, this last kind of fifth thought that I want you to, to, to see. The first section um, is Paul giving instructions for the health of the body. And he's talking about rightly esteeming leaders. We're going to read that in a second. The second section is he's dealing sensitively with the varying needs of the saints. So how the saints, the saints is just a fancy word for the people that are in the church, or should be taken care of and how they should take care of one another. The, the fourth section, verses 16 through 18, is establishing a joyful assembly. And then the last section, which is very important for us today and is going to tie in with what I've been teaching, the last section is dealing with the ministry of the Holy Spirit and prophetic utterances. So when prophecy comes forward, how do we deal with it? How do we judge it? What does it look like? Um, how do we, uh, what do we do with good prophecy? What do we do with bad prophecy? And so he finishes this section with that. And so let's read this together, verse 12. And these are Paul's instructions to the harvest. How's that? Y'all ready for this? So don't hear me, hear Paul. But we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction. And me and my dad say, amen. amen. <laughs> that you appreciate... Those, no, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't think, um, I don't think that probably in 15 years that we've done anything for pastor's appreciation for you and mom in probably 15 years. Um, what you don't know is next week before you speak or whoever's speaking, you or mom, I'm kicking you out for a couple minutes because this church is going to bless you and mom. I didn't tell the first service this. Y'all got a little exclusive bonus on that, all right? I have an idea, a plan. I'm going to let you guys in on it next week, all right? So come with your pockets full, all right? I'm just kidding. But come next week. It's going to be really, really special. Don't forget to put it on Facebook. Yeah, I will. I will. I will. I'll say just, just eat rice and beans the whole week. Save your pennies, kids. All right. But it says, we request of you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. Now, I want to tell you this right now. If you want to not be a burden on your pastors, learn to live in peace with one another. Because I promise 99% of our stress is not how do we pay the bills or this or that or the other. 99% of our stress is usually rolled up in couple of y'all not getting along. And if I have ever seen some petty stuff, it's right here in the church. She looked at me funny. And then the next week, she didn't look at me at all. Well, which one do you want? Do you want her to look at you or not look at you? <laughs> he brushed by me and didn't say hi. Come on. We do some petty stuff in church. 
Come on, but I believe we're called to live in peace with one another. Why? Because this group of people that are in this building today, there's only one way that we're gonna fully accomplish the mission of the vision that God's given us here, and that's if we learn to live in peace and harmony with one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, seeing the treasure in each other. You might have every reason in the world to open up your mouth, either to somebody or about somebody. You may have every reason in the world to feel justified, but if it will cause uh, uh, something that looks different than unity and harmony and oneness and peace, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Come on. Like Chris Farley said, shut your yapper, Okay. I was watching some videos of his this week. He was, he was a genius, but that was from his skit. What is it? Down by the river? What's it? What was his name? Matt Foley, right? Matt Foley? Yeah, down by the river. Shut your yapper, right? We just need to learn to live in peace with one another. And what I found out is this, church, is the more we try to be right, the more miserable we are. So you can prove yourself in a situation, they're wrong, I'm right, you still go home miserable. I've never met anyone that was right in an argument and felt good about themselves afterwards, right? But when you pursue peace, you will learn to live a joyful life, and we as a body will accomplish so much more when we are at peace with one another. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Paul. Verse 14, we urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly. This is another section. This is dealing sensitively with the varying needs of the saints. Um, unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. How many of y'all could use some more patience in your life? <laughs> okay, some of y'all are holding your hands up way too long, all right? I'm getting, I'm getting impatient. Put your hands down. Come on, we need to be patient with one another. We need to realize that, that not everybody's in the same place you and I are. Come on. Yeah. Not everybody sees things the same way. Be patient with one another. Yeah. Uh, verse 15 says this, if we, if we could look at it. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Uh, like we've been talking uh, the last couple of weeks, we, we, we need to stop searching and seeking out what we can find wrong in the person next to us. And we need to stop buying into a false identity of the person next to us. And we need to start believing the best about one another. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if our mindset wasn't, oh, wow, you actually did something good. And instead, we were shocked when somebody did something that we didn't agree with. Instead of constantly believing that everyone around us is, is, is uh, you know, this, this spirit of skepticism or this uh, uh, constantly being paranoid that the person next to you is, is somehow going to mess you over or is involved in something that you need to call them out on or whatever it may be. Wouldn't it be great as, if, as a church and we lit a fire in this place where we saw nothing but the beauty in one another yeah. and that when somebody did us evil, that the last thing on our mind was trying to get justice in that situation? How many times have you and I started a conversation with, well, you just don't understand what they did, what they said. Come on. And all we're doing is setting up this system of evil for evil. And this third section here, which is dealing with establishing a joyful assembly, I promise you I'm getting somewhere. Verse 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is not a commandment in the sense that if you don't do this, God's just not going to be your friend. This is like, hey, you want to have a, a healthy, beautiful, joyful journey with God? Learn to uh, rejoice, have a joyful heart. Learn to pray and just be, it just be uh, you know, essentially leaking out of you all the time. You're just constantly in a state of petition with God. And the third thing here is uh, that we would be thankful. We would be grateful. Come on. If we, if we put that on our, our, our mirror every morning, rejoice, have a joyful heart, pray, and be grateful, be thankful. Man, if we just lived according to that, how different would our day look, right? 
for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, the fourth section, so we have one, two, three sections here. We've kind of broken them up in pieces. The fourth section, verses 19, 20, 21, and 22, it's all one thought together, and you'll see it here. It says, and not quenching the spirit of the ministry and prophetic utterance. It's dealing with how do we deal with prophecy? How many of you have ever heard a prophecy before? How many of you have ever received a prophecy before, a prophetic word? All right. It, it happens here, not every Sunday, but it happens here a lot of times. It comes in different forms in different ways. Uh, my dad will prophesy over somebody, or you'll hear somebody have a prophetic utterance in a moment. Or we've had, we have people that have gone through our school here with David Wagner, who, who we, uh, we give permission to give a prophetic word. Um, but there are boundaries for that prophetic word that keep us safe that keep us um, from going off in a direction we shouldn't go. So one of the things David Wagner always says, he says, if you give a prophetic word to somebody, no mates, no dates, and no babies. So we don't prophesy mates, we don't prophesy dates, and we don't prophesy babies. Not that God doesn't give you a picture of something like that, but, but if, if, God forbid, it doesn't happen the way you said it, you would hate to set somebody up for feeling that way. Amen. And so no mates, no dates, no babies. That's something we've always done here. But Paul here is saying, listen, in, in, in the ministry of the prophetic, here are some guidelines that you should, you should follow. Now, I know you all just sitting here thinking, what does this have to do with you even preaching? I'm getting there, right? <laughs> Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. This is a general exhortation. This is just kind of a general like, hey, don't quench the spirit. Verse 20 is actually getting specific with one of the ways you shouldn't quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances. In other words, uh, don't shut them down. Don't shut down prophetic utterances. Give an opportunity for, for God's spirit to move uh, in that way through the prophetic. And then it gets a little bit more specific. It says, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Now, I want you to see this just because there's a new verse marker in verse 22. I want you to see this, that verse 21 ends with a semicolon, which means the thought is continuing. This isn't a new sentence. So actually, the sentence reads this way. But examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, this version of this verse may not be familiar to you, but how many of you have ever heard, avoid the appearance of evil? And how many of you have ever heard that used on your life in a way where somebody was trying to get you to not hang out with or be around a certain crowd or whatever it may be? I got news for you, folks. That was jacked way out of context. It actually has nothing to do with what we have made it have something to do with. It is a complete thought at the end of this where it's saying what to do with good prophecy and what to do with bad prophecy. And it says this about good prophecy in verse 21. It says, examine it carefully and hold fast, fast to what is good, but abstain from that which is evil. In other words, when it's a good prophecy, hold on to it. And when it's an evil or a bad prophecy, get away from it. Is anybody's mind going, what? Now, the reason I'm preaching this is because when I, my message last week, I thought to myself, if you're religious enough to talk yourself out of my message from last week, even though I built a case from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus, Paul, the Psalms, David, everything in between said the same thing, how would you talk yourself out of my message last week? Well, what you would say is, I can't invite everyone to my table because I have to abstain from the appearance of evil. We've taken a verse that is completely and absolutely not about that, and we have used it as an excuse to keep our tables looking exactly like us, thinking exactly like us, come on, operating exactly like us, with the same worldview, come on. So you have an Uncle Joe who has a birthday party, and he might be struggling in his life, but because he likes to dial up two Milwaukee's bests in the middle of it, you're like, we need to leave, Martha. Let's get out of here. Joe's drinking. You know what happens. Well, maybe Joe in the middle of his buzz, and I'm going to go there for a second, maybe he just loses his, his uh, awareness enough that he begins to open up to you, and you'll have an opportunity to plant a seed in that moment. What are you scared of? Joe ain't going to put that in your hand. 
I actually think that we think darkness is contagious. Darkness is not contagious. If you are light, we're the contagious one. We spread, darkness doesn't. Light spreads, darkness has to go when light invades it. So we have a dark world out there waiting for you and I to quit making excuses based on scriptures that have nothing to do with anything that we're talking about and invade the darkness with the light that is inside of us. I want to make something very clear to you. I'm so fired up, I can't help myself. And I'm tired. I was up all night and stuff was happening I don't want to talk about. It was bad news. Sun poisoning is no joke. Oh, I'm going to tell you this right now. I, 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 I want to encourage you because one of the things that they, they talk about in, in some of the programs that we have at the church, like Harvest House, is you know, you need to change your friends, your friend group. And it's true because if, if, if you, you kind of become what you hang around, especially if you're struggling with something, and that's fine for that moment because you're in a season where you're learning to literally live a new life. You don't even know who you are in that moment. You're, you've been so, you know, uh, your identity has been stolen by whatever it is that you've been facing and dealing with. And in that moment, it's a good thing to begin to surround yourself with people that are going to speak life and are going to tell you who you are. But you can't stay there. Church, you can't stay there. Redemption is not the final say. If you've been redeemed, then you need to be redemption to the rest of the world around you. And so you can be redeemed. And when you get into a place where you know who you are, go back to those 10 friends. So don't, don't say goodbye to those 10 friends. Put those 10 friends on hold and say, I'll be back when I find myself and know who I am. But I'm coming back to you because the same thing that God did for me, he wants to do for you. And the only way it's going to happen is through relationship and connection and you trusting me. Come on. And you can make it clear to me. I know what we used to do. I'm not into that anymore. I'm not, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. I'm not into it. But I mean, do you know that some Christians are afraid to talk to somebody who's just from another faith? Yeah. Like, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> really? Some of the most enlightening uh, experiences about my own faith have come in understanding where other people's faiths perspectives. And they might say something, I think to myself, that's weird. I was in uh, Iraq, and we were amongst um, the, one of the most beautiful people groups in the world, the Yazidis. They are uh, part of the, the Kurds. They're Yazidi Kurds in northern Iraq, northern Iraq, Syria, and Iran. There's a section of it called Kurdistan. It's a, kind of an unofficial nation. Um, they've never been recognized, and they want to be recognized, but it kind of borders Syria, Iran, and Iraq. And I was there in Iraq, and I was with these people, these Yazidis. They were the most beautiful, beautiful people you could ever imagine in the way that they hosted and treated. They had nothing. They took out the only thing nice they had was a, China, uh, was a tea set. And they bring that tea set out. And I remember being with one of them, and the girl, uh, the girl and, the, and the, 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 the children scraped together their dinar, and they ran down to the street store just to buy one soda, to pour a little bit in cups, to give it to the visitors. I mean, it's just beautiful. But, and they kind of believe in Jesus, but they also have this other God, and he's a peacock. <laughs> so we were making jokes. We said, we need to get him before the peacock does. <laughs> really, it's a peacock. Like, that's weird, right? But if we get so hung up, what do you think is going to happen? You think the peacock's going to get me if I talk to them? And, and I have it on tape. The grandfather of this whole family, we have it on tape. We videoed it. Um, his, he, Baba is his grandfather. Um, and so they call him Baba. And, and we, we had this, I was videoing it when we talked to him. And we were talking to him. And we didn't even address the peacock, God. We were just hoping the peacock god just gets like some sort of like swine flu or something, you know, like some sort of <laughs> disease. It's like, no, we didn't even address that. We didn't sit down with him and say, let me tell you how wrong you are. I'm going to stand on the truth and blah, blah, blah. Like we're scared or something. 
We just simply talked about Jesus. And in that moment, I remember, I'll never forget it, through the interpreter, this grandfather with his children and grandchildren and gathered around him. And, and they were refugees. They, they, they fled from Mount Sinjar, where, where Mosul is right near there because they'd been driven out of their home and their family was killed. And this grandfather is, is, is what's left of his family. They're living in an abandoned chicken coop. You think that Jesus is going to walk into that room and be the moral authority in that moment? Do you think that Jesus, this family that has seen their loved ones slaughtered in front of their very eyes because of hatred, is going to come in there and tell them that their peacock God is whatever? Or do you think he's going to love them right where they're at for who they are and what they're experiencing? And we begin to talk about it. And when we begin to talk about Jesus, Baba began to cry. And he said, I believe in Jesus. I believe that he's the only way. I believe my family. And he said, he stopped. And he said, I want to declare it to my entire family. I want you to listen up to me. We follow Jesus and Jesus only. We never had to address the peacock in the room. All right. We never had to address that because it wasn't, come on, listen to me. It wasn't about being caught up with something that was just not who they were on the inside. It wasn't, we weren't getting caught up in that. We wanted to focus on the truth that will set them free in that moment. We wanted to focus on, we're building relationship with them. We're hearing them. We're listening to them. We're not judging them. I can't tell you how many conversations I have with Christians where it's like, you're never going to believe what this crazy guy said to me. Really? You think we're going to reach people with that mindset? I heard he's a Democrat. I heard she's a Republican. I heard this. I heard that. I don't care what letter is on your voter registration card. We need to see the world as an opportunity for them to be set free with the grace and the mercy and the beauty of the gospel. And it's not going to happen staying in our little box protected by folks who think like us, act like us, believe like us. It's never going to happen that way. Amen. So what are you saying, Pastor Dan? I need to... Shut up, I know. I'll close. What are you saying to us today, Pastor? And what I'm saying is, is that the heartbeat of this church has never been to be this cute little perfect box with a bow on it. And it never will be. Amen. And what I'm saying to you is we need to get away from this phenomenon that's happened where we leave the evangelistic exploits up to a couple people in fancy white suits. Come on. It was never meant to be that way. It was never meant to be that way, but we have taken scriptures like this one and other things that I've been talking about in the last couple of weeks, and we've used them to confine people like you to the seat, to the pew, while a select few, unfortunately mostly men, are the super evangelists that blow into town. It was never meant to be that way. You are the army. You are the evangelists. You are the light of the world. I said this in the first service. Jesus takes this group of men that are total jokers. I mean, foul mouth fishermen. Violent people who, you know, get ticked off and cut off a man's ear. Swindlers and tax collectors. He takes them. Do you think they had their act cleaned up by this point? I got news for you, they didn't. And he says, I am the light of the world. And then he says, you are the light of the world. Now go. Go be light. So think about this for a moment. If we have used this, and I've, I've heard it a thousand times. If we use this scripture so far out of context, to say, well, you really think you should be going over there? Aren't you so supposed to abstain from the appearance of evil? So let me translate that for you. That's a dark place, Mr. Light, Mrs. Light. Do you really think you should be taking your light over there? Um, that's the point of light. You want to know why most Christians are so frustrated sitting in the pew? Because of scriptures like this that have been taken out of context and being used to confine you to the pew. I can speak for my dad, my mom, our whole pastoral team, my family. We want to empower 
and anoint you to reach out, to invite to your table, to build relationship with people that don't think like you, don't act like you, don't come from the same background as you. We want your table to be full of the most diverse group of people you could ever imagine because we believe that light always invades and conquers darkness. And all we need to do is get you to believe in yourself and set you up to be light in dark places. That's it. I want to close today, but I want to empower you to do this. I want to empower you to realize that we're all in this journey together. I want to empower you to not be divisive. I want to empower you to to come and make peace with one another, to see us as the body of Christ and to be that to the world around us. Be light. And for heaven's sakes, read the couple verses before and after any verse you're going to use to beat somebody up with. Context is everything in the word of God. So I'll tell you what I'd like to abstain from. I'd like to abstain as a church from filling our tables and people that I'm around looking, thinking, believing, acting exactly like me. I want people that are going to challenge me and enrich me, give me an opportunity to hear something different and give me an opportunity to maybe let them hear something different, feel something, experience something different. Do we really believe that what we have inside of us is real and unique and powerful? Do we really believe that what we have carrying on the inside of us can reach the world around us and impact those that we're with? Jesus' shadow healed somebody. You have the powerful light of the gospel living on the inside of you. Don't confine yourself because of bad theology to people that think like you, act like you, and look like you. Welcome people from different backgrounds, religions, worldviews into your life. And you're going to find out your faith will be stronger than ever and your life more fulfilling and richer than ever. Amen? Get out of here. We love you. We're not even going to pray. Get out of here. Love you.